Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program 2 video. Now so far, my expeditions to various planets and moons in this game have been things that I've already essentially done in Kerbal Space Program 1, since, you know, I was making videos on that game for years, and right now KSP2 is basically KSP1 but with less stuff, but better graphics and better UI, don't at me, I hate the parts manager too, but given that KSP2 is still in a slightly uh, rocky state, there is one mission that I can do in this game but could never do in KSP1. I love building Kerbal colonies. Maybe it's because I'm British, so I'm genetically predisposed to do so, but in KSP1, I've built permanent bases on every planet and moon, except for Bop and Pol, because who cares, but I've never built a base on Jewel, because it's a gas giant, so it doesn't have a surface. I mean, technically, gas giants have a solid core, but you get what I mean. But in KSP2, for some reason, Jewel has a solid surface below its clouds. So while we're still stuck in the uh, brief period after release where there's still no thermal system in KSP2, I figured let's take this opportunity to land a surface base with two large rovers on the mysterious Julian surface using a rocket that has been my biggest FPS killer yet. Seriously, it took like 30 minutes to get to orbit. Most of this video is going to play back at like, I don't know, 20 times faster than real time speed probably. And that is in part due to the part count. Um, you can see me building the base. In fact, the base is largely complete whilst I was waffling on introducing the subject of this video. But yeah, it's a big old base. Can't really fit inside a fairing. And I'm still just a bit too scared to build things in multiple launches because docking ports in this game are still... I just don't trust them. So I'm just going to launch it as one giant monolithic structure, which means it's going to be, you know, a lot of parts for the game to simulate. So it's going to kill the FPS in that sense. It's going to be, well, there's lots of things to wobble around. So that's going to kill the performance as well. And look at it. It's massive. It's not very aerodynamic. So it's going to take a huge rocket to get this thing into orbit. So it was a pretty tough thing to launch. And obviously we've got these two rovers as well, which are, you know, pretty sizable. They're gonna, you know, add to the whole wobbliness and complexity and part count and all that. So I hope you enjoy this mission. Well, I was in. I hope you enjoy watching this mission because doing a mission like this, it isn't that fun to do because it just takes so long to do the launch. I, I won't be playing the launch back in real time speed for you guys because you got places to be. I get it, but I'll show you like a brief snippet of what my FPS looked like before rewinding, and then you can watch it at a nice, uh, enjoyable frame rate. But I think, just looking at the base, it's largely complete. And I do really, really like the large crew cabins in Kerbal Space Program 2. And I think, you know, if and when we do get, you know, the proper colonies, the game's going to be so good. I do think that KSP 2, first and foremost, is a colony building game and a KSP 1 clone second. But obviously right now, that's all it really is. It's a KSP 1 clone because the colony stuff, it ain't in the game. But when I was like, you know, when I, I, spoiler alert, this mission succeeds, I do in fact land on Jewel, I could get out and walk around and like, see my little Kerbal next to these massive crew modules, I don't know, it's just, uh, I was, I was moved, I was inspired, I guess I'm just such a talented uh, builder, I'm really just, uh, you know, tooting my own horn as it were. But I hope you enjoy it, and if you do think that it is a good design and worthy of me celebrating myself, why not like the video? Got together, plugged in, and of course, if you do enjoy Kerbal content, KSP2, uh, then subscribe. I make these videos. I try and make at least one a week. Uh, sometimes I have a weeks where I don't, but I think for the past few weeks, I've been, I've been pretty good. And obviously, I make space use on Mondays. I'm guessing most people are subscribed, so you kind of know what this channel is. But there we are. It's it's done. I've gone for this nice sort of baby blue and white color scheme for the base itself. And I've gone for red and white for the rovers. I think at this point, I was just trying to... Oh, the game froze. I was trying to sort out the stacks. I had to remove an engine plate. And then I, was, I couldn't get the boosters to stick together again properly. But it all worked out fine in the end. And yeah, I'm still obsessed with the SLS color scheme for my lower stages. You know, white SRBs flanking big orange boosters. Although they do have slightly more engines, these boosters, than the SLS. I think it's, they've got nine uh, RS-25 engines rather than the uh, five on the SLS. Anyway, let's launch. Okay. Can 
we please have a, a moment of silence for my sanity there? And obviously I had to launch this thing more than once. You know, I had to do the real launch that you're watching now and the test launches. So I'm now going to play the footage back at a nice sped up pace so you can actually enjoy the video somewhat. <laughs> Oh, beautiful to see. You know, to see it like at a, a playable frame rate. You know, maybe one day this will be what the game looks like, you know, running at real time speed. Particularly with a PC such as mine with an RTX 4090 graphics card and a 5950X CPU. I forgot what CPU I have for a second. It's pretty pretty powerful PC, basically. Uh, so we can just dream. We can imagine how things might end up working out by watching this sped up footage here. And it's quite fun, actually, watching my. Uh, but I, I actually really enjoy watching my videos back because they're, they're great videos, guys. No, but it's like I get to see what it looks like in real time speed. A, because the lag is just so bad, you can't really get a sense of what the launch would look like at normal speed. But also, I'm having to just hyper fixate on the nav ball. I'm, I never look at my rockets when they're like this because you can see it's very wobbly and very unstable. As soon as I start looking at the rocket, I see it starting to wobble. I panic and start trying to, you know, it affects my input, so I just hyper fixate on the nav ball. I don't look at anything else on the screen. I'm just looking at the numbers and just managing the gravity turn and doing it all that way. So it's quite nice then to watch the launch and say like, oh look, that was a rocket. I was I was flying a rocket during that time. What what a, what? A, there you go. There's a little bit of insight into my my creator my creator progress. My pre create the how I. So I'm a space creator, guys. Segue. As in, like, I make space content, right? I make Kerbal Space Program videos. That's got the word space in it. And I also make space this week. I feel like I talked about this earlier, didn't I? But I'm going somewhere with this. There's an event in Germany. Oh, I forgot the date now. This is really bad. Let me find it. Yes, on the 21st of October, the biggest meet and greet of the European space community is taking place. It's at the Technik Museum Speyer, which is in Germany. Um, yeah, I'm going to be there on the 21st, but there's going to be other people there. Uh, Shadow Zone is going to be there, uh, Star Wars Dennis, uh, Everyday Astronaut, uh, and uh, there's there's quite a few. I'm just like, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. And who knows, maybe there's going to be some like KSP2 stuff there as well. I don't know. You didn't hear that from me. I'm just like guessing. I, I don't know anything. Um, yeah. So it's going to be great. So if you if you live in Germany near Speyer or, you know, wherever, I've heard it's got a fairly good train system there, right? You can get the train there. Come meet me. It's going to be great. And um, we can have a we'd have a fun old time. But yes, with all that said and done, as you can see, we are almost in you know full orbit. Just got to do a small burn at Apoapsis to circularize, and then we'll be on our way. And I'm not really going to be using much time warp for the burns, as in like physics time warp, because I find that doing interplanetary burns, as in like you know burns that affect your trajectory uh, that's outside of the sphere of influence of the celestial body you're currently in. That sentence made sense, right? Uh, it doesn't, it seems to be a bit glitchy, but it's very inconsistent, so I don't know what the trigger is. Does, it, does this bug, is this like bug known about? And you guys know exactly what the trigger is and what I'm talking about, and I just haven't bothered researching it properly. It, let me know in the comments below if there is actually a specific set of circumstances that affect the reliability of physics time warp that I ought to know about. <laughs> but uh, as an authoritative figure in this game, um, let me know. I'm now just going to go ahead and just destroy the debris that um, that is those three lower boosts that are detached just to try and increase my FPS somewhat. As you can see though, there are now three vessels there as well. So I don't really know what happened. We'll have to end up destroying those again at some point. Anyway, we're now going to time warp to a dual transfer window because I forgot to set that up before launching. But yep, draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to dual. The angle that line forms at the sun should be around 95 degrees. Really doesn't matter a great deal with dual though because it has an absolutely gigantic sphere of influence. So you, transfer windows don't matter that much. Now I'm doing a quick save quick load here because as you can see when I went back to my ship it, there's now fairings around the engines. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, oh, by the way, and also those three vessels have now become debris again. So that was a bit weird. Uh, so, yeah, I, I did a quick save, quick load to try and get rid of those fairings, but they are now here to stay for the rest of the mission. Luckily, they didn't affect the engine's performance. At least I don't think the engines worked. So hopefully they didn't affect the engine performance. And uh, so that, that's just um, that's just a little quirk that's going to be on this vessel now for the rest of the mission, at least until we detach those engine stages. Those engine stages, they're not going to burn like the first three boosters, you know, the big three orange boosters, that all drained fuel together and then separated at once. These are in an asparagus setup. Or I guess it's like a, 
what's the step below asparagus? Onion setup? And it's only asparagus when there's like loads of boosters in a big circle. Uh, either way, what I'm trying to say is that we've got crossfeed. So the fuel being consumed by all three engines at this stage are only from the two side boosters. Once those two side boosters are empty, we'll detach them so it's just a single core and that will still be full of fuel. More efficient way of doing things, you know, and all that. And uh, that's that's just my little summer summary of that. So we're doing two burns to get to Jewel, just to try and maximize the amount of time we're spending at Kerbin Periapsis. More efficient that way, it's called the Oberth effect. But before we continue with the mission, I wanted to just go back to the uh, tracking station, delete that debris, just to try and maximize my FPS because I've heard, I don't know if this is accurate, so citation needed, but I've heard in the wherever, I don't know, Reddit or Twitter or something, uh, that one of the things that makes KSP2 quite laggy is that the game simulates every single vessel all of the time. Uh, so by, you know, running new saves each time and deleting vessels you're not controlling uh, helps with the frame rate. I'm guessing it's doing that because of the fact that it's eventually going to be a multiplayer game, so it kind of needs to be able to simulate. But I, I don't know. I ain't a game dev. I don't know anything about coding, really. I know how to ask ChatGPT to write batch files for me. That's about it. <laughs> ah, that was a nice short burn, wasn't it? for you guys. <laughs> uh, for me, it was a very tedious process because I'm not using physics time warp for those burns. So yeah, I do the burns at real time speed and then just speed the footage up for you guys. During that burn I just did, the footage was playing back at 40 times faster than real time speed. And that's going to be the case for our dual descent as well. Uh, 40 times playback is the fastest playback speed my editing software can do. Just to give you a sense of uh, what the true disparity is between what you're seeing on screen and what was actually happening as this mission was being filmed. And don't worry, I wasn't just like gormlessly staring at the screen questioning my life. I did have like stuff to do. <laughs> So um, I'm still playing Sonic Advance uh, 3, I've got my Game Boy Advance with a flash card on my desk, that's now what I do when I'm playing KSP2, is I'll play a bit of KSP2, then when it's just, you know, sitting there running slowly, I'll just uh, play a bit of Sonic. I'm on, uh, I just completed Oil Oat, I've, I've now, nobody relates to this now. I've done the first three levels, it's like ocean based zone, I've done that, now I'm on Toy Kingdom zone, wish me luck guys, anyone that played Sonic Advance 3 knows that it's a good game. I started playing Sonic Advance 1, which I've actually never played. I played Sonic Advance 2 and 3, but never Sonic Advance 1. And then I got to the boss where it's like underwater and there's no air pockets. And it was just a bit, it was, I kept dying and I was like, you know what, I, I, I don't care. I want to I wanna go to my happy place. I want to play Sonic Advance 3. So I'm playing Sonic Advance 3 now. Great game. Uh, I highly recommend Astro Boy The Omega Factor. So that's like an actually underrated game. No, not underrated. It, everyone rated it highly, but it's a very um, under known about. What's the what's the, like? Un, it's not it's not underrated. Everyone rated it really high, but no one knows about it. It's what's the word? I'm having a complete blank right now. But you know, you know what I'm saying? It's a very good game. Game Boy Advance. You can just pirate it. No shame in saying that because it's not being manufactured anymore, so you're not actually stealing money for anyone, so it's fine. So yeah, that's my uh, Mad Clown Game Boy Advance game recommendation of the week. Astro Boy Omega Factor. And obviously I guess Sonic Advance 3, that's good as well, but yeah, Astro Boy Omega Factor, that's definitely, that's next on my list of Game Boy Advance games to play whilst, you know, KSP2 is just running in the background doing something. Now, I had hoped, my initial plan was just to go straight down to Jewel and just enter its atmosphere, from like a not circularizing or anything because there's no thermal right so it didn't matter but I forgot that the game does still have aero in it right because you know planes work and like when you enter an atmosphere you slow down and Jules atmosphere is very dense so actually I hit Jules atmosphere and the craft just completely disintegrated instantly so I was like oh no well let's just circularize at low let's just circularize at Jewel periapsis and you know just re-enter from low Jewel orbit but I've only got 2,649 meters per second of delta V, which is not enough to do that. So we're going to have to use some gravity assists to lower our apoapsis. So the first gravity assist is going to be using Tylo, game equivalent of Ganymede, which is the biggest moon in the solar system. And it's got a very big gravity well, Tylo. So it's really great for doing captures into dual orbit for relatively low delta V expense. Uh, I'm actually spending a lot of delta V getting my Tylo encounter because I'm kind of getting my Tylo encounter after entering Jules' sphere of influence. If I'd done this earlier on in the mission, you know, in deep interplanetary space, it would have been more efficient. But, you know, I couldn't be bothered to like rewind, so uh, I was just like, well, we'll just we'll, we'll try and see if we can get it without having to reload an earlier save. 
And uh, yeah, go from there. So I overshot my burn a little bit. So now I'm going to just painfully spin the craft around to get my Tyloperiapsis. Well, just to get a Tyloperiapsis rather than a Tylo impact site, right? Where is it? There we are. Perfect. Just zooming in to make sure we're going to clear it. Tylo has no atmosphere, so we can get pretty close to its surface and be fine. As you can see, my jewel orbit is now you know, vastly lowered. Let's see if we can circularize. No, we can't. We haven't got enough fuel in our ship to lower ourselves into a really, really low. I wanted to get the lowest possible jewel orbit, which is uh, 200 kilometers. That's the height at which jewel's atmosphere starts. So we're going to have to do another gravity assist after using Tylo. We're going to use Lathe, the second largest Julian moon, uh, to lower our jewel orbit once again to a point where we can do the rest using our engines and not run out of fuel. There's Tyler, by the way, she's doing a nice little slow flyby. Well, it's a fast flyby, but I didn't speed the footage up too much so you guys could see it if you haven't seen Tyler already. The planets in this game do look very, very good. Like, from a distance, like, I know yeah, there's an argument to be made that modded KSP-1 does look better, but from a distance, I don't think any KSP-1 mods look as good as KSP-2. So hopefully, you know, if the game, you know, continues development and things are seen through to the end, it'll all work out in the end in these rough months of early access. It will have been worth it, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, just fine-tuning my lathe encounter now just to get my orbit around Jewel to be where I want it to be. I wanted my periapsis to be about, well, between 200 and 250 uh, kilometers above the surface. Obviously, it's exactly 200. That's too low because we're going to have to do a retrograde burn to lower our, our apoapsis. And if we're exactly at 200, we're going to end up dipping into the atmosphere. And I wanted to play things as safe as possible. So Amy, I guess, between 200 and 250, aiming for a sweet spot of around 230 as my periapsis height around Jewel. Let's see how things go. It's very sort of pulsing the engine now, watching that periapsis marker. And yep, we're definitely clear of Lathe's atmosphere. How are we doing for Jewel? Ah, I, I overshot a little bit. But I wanted to make a quick maneuver now, just to make sure that yes, we now have enough Delta V to get into a low Jewel orbit, and we do. So now it's just a case of doing a quick uh, fire in the other direction, just to raise our lathe periapsis slightly to lessen the effect of the gravity assist, just so that our dual periapsis is at a better height. And uh, I think that really was a case of blink and you miss it, but our new dual periapsis is 228, perfectly in that sweet spot that I was aiming for. And there's lathe, by the way. Maybe I'll do some more missions to lathe at some point. Lathe, I guess, isn't that fun of a place at the moment because is buoyancy still broken in this game? I tried making some watercraft ages ago and I couldn't get anything to float, everything just sinks. It'd be nice to do some like more aquatic missions once that's all sorted out. But yeah, as you can see, I'm just setting up my final maneuver to get ourselves into low dual orbit. And we can start doing this the stupid part of this mission, which is of course landing this colony on the uh, air quotes now surface of Jewel. Are there any other missions like this in Kerbal Space Program 2 which are possible because of the fact that the game is still a bit you know, a bit janky? You know, I've already done my Sun Station mission where we've got a station in low solar orbit that realistically would definitely explode, melt, whatever, uh, if there was thermal in this game. Obviously this mission was is presumably going to be impossible when the game is complete. Are there any other missions like this which are possible at the moment but shouldn't be possible if the game, you know, were finished. Let me know in the comments down below, or if you have any other ideas for KSV missions that you want to see on this channel. I'm all ears. I've been doing this these things for many years, so I've kind of done everything. So it's hard thinking of original ideas. I mean, luckily, KSP2 is like a new canvas. I can just copy all my old videos, but I'd rather not do that if I can get away with it. So there are some missions I've done in KSP1 that I'd like to do in KSP2 because just to see how they differ. Uh, one of my favorite mission concepts of all time is the Lunex shuttle mission, which was a US Air Force proposition to land on the moon. Uh, the return vessel would have, would have been, I think it was a direct, yeah, it was a direct ascent. But the return vessel was like a little space plane that lifted off from the moon and then went back to Earth and would glide down. To, and it's a fun old, it's a fun mission to do in Kerbal Space Program. So I'll probably end up doing that again in KSP2. But anything else, you know, let me know in the comment section down below. And here you can see me. We are now performing our deceleration burn to enter Jules' atmosphere. And you can see it's got volumetric clouds, actually. It's not just a flat texture like it was in KSP-1. And I think in time, you know, things like lightning storm effects may get added to the game. That will look really cool. But we've got a good foundation to work on here. And there you go. Our lower stage has been detached. Now we can activate all of our parachutes. I set the deploy altitude for the radial chutes to be super duper high, just so we've got that kind of extra layer of safety. Although I don't think I needed to bother because, again, Jules' atmosphere is so thick, it will slow us down very, very rapidly. So you can see on the left hand side of the screen our surface velocity, which is about 5,430 ish meters per second at the moment. That's going to suddenly plummet. 
Uh, nice, we went a bit faster though. Let's just speed the footage up. We're now going 40 times faster than real time speed. Uh, pretty much for the entire descent, actually. I uh, wasn't using any time up. I daren't, I didn't dare use any time up because I didn't want like the craft to spaghetti. Because this is like a problem in KSP1 as well. Especially when parachutes are involved. Physics time warp can cause things to shake apart and break. And I just don't want to take any risks. So. Did another few levels in Sonic Advance 3 <laughs> uh, whilst this thing descended. I think it took about 20 minutes in total. I'm not quite sure though. Let me, someone here is probably going to crunch the numbers. Now I've told you how fast the footage is going to be played back. But yeah, it felt like it was like 20 minutes or so. So yeah, I think, I, I think the way I worked that out was I was watching our altitude gauge fall. And I would count how many seconds it took to clear one kilometer. And I think it was like 17 seconds per kilometer. So I'm like, ah, it's like, you know, 17 times however many meters we've got left. Uh, it's going to take about that much, so I'll go away and do something and then come back when that time has elapsed. And we should have landed. So that was uh, how, I, how I did that and stayed sane. And here we are. We have entered the cloud layer of Jewel. And there below us straight away. I thought it would be like a much longer descent. But there we are. There is the ground rapidly approaching beneath us. And I'm going to slow the footage down to a slightly, you know, not so fast. So you can watch the touchdown. Boom. Bit of a lag there. I cut out a lot just then. You know when it went down to like, you know, a couple of frames per second? Each frame was literally about two to three minutes. The game was really thinking about it. I guess this is one of the problems of like KSP2 simulating every single joint between every single part, I guess is what the cause of that lag was. If you've not seen my uh, Kit Bash Model Club video, I actually got the opportunity to speak to Harvester who was the developer of KSP1, and he wasn't really satisfied with the way, you know, the game would always simulate every join because that was always causing wobble and stuff. So he kind of solved the problem with Kitbash by just having the game treat the you know vehicle as one giant piece, and then he applies his own wobble physics to it after that, or I guess just physics to it, it doesn't need to wobble. So maybe, I don't know if it's possible for KSP2 to just change over to that system, because that would be great. I don't know if I've ever mentioned it on this channel before, but I'm not a huge fan of the wobble in KSP2. So it'd be nice if that just, you know, were, were, didn't exist, basically. And there we are, the slightly explosive detachment of the second rover. But, all in all, that that's it. We've, we've done, we did the thing. We did, we've got the rovers out. The, the castle, I guess, it looks a bit like a Disney castle, doesn't it? If you are like squinting and you weren't looking at the screen and were blind. Uh, it's got, I like the little spires there. Those are the uranium plants. Uh, I was a bit confused by those parts at first because it said they need uranium. So I'm like, oh, how do they work? And then I realized, oh yeah, actually they just have the uranium built into them. So that, that's what those things are. If you're wondering what those parts are, that's going to generate our power down here. Because as you can see, looking at the sky there, there's no sunlight. So have to sort of rely on nuclear power. And I tried to get Kerbal out to go and explore, but it was a bit, we we're a bit boxed in. And the surface gravity of Joule, uh, it may come as a surprise, is very high. We can barely jump off the ground. So we're going to have to get a Kerbal out on one of the peripheral structures uh, to EVA out that way. So I had to scroll through the little Kerbal view for a bit until I found a Kerbal that was in one of the little Capola modules. And there we go. We can EVA out and go for a little waddle on the surface of Joule. I don't know if this is like intentionally the surface because it has a sort of like wispy appearance to it. So I don't know if this is just meant to simulate kind of if you sent a probe down through the atmosphere just before it becomes crushed uh, by the pressures or destroyed by the thermal, you'd be able to see this like darker layer of gas below you there to sort of simulate the deeper layers of the gas giant. Uh, obviously, this wouldn't be a stark transition, right? In real life, it would be like a gradual transition, getting more and more viscous and horrific, basically, before you impact the what we assume to be a solid core. So maybe this is like a crude simulation of that. But again, it has collision, which is weird. And actually, you can get the camera to go below the surface and you can see like stuff there. So, but yeah, it just does look like the ground is sort of like oscillating and stuff. Or maybe that's just the texture and it's moving as I'm moving the camera. Who knows? What are your what are your theories? Why 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 is Jewel? Why did they do this? <laughs> uh, let me know what you think in the comments. And I thought I'd finish the video up by going for a little drive. Uh, we've got these rovers, they've got RTGs on them. Well, this one's only got one because this is the rover that flipped over and blew up one of its RTGs and one of its batteries, so it uh, can't regenerate electricity as much as the, as rapidly, I should say, as the other rover. But it will do the job. I just held down W and then just, we can just cruise up into the distance. I'll just gradually speed the footage up to make it look like we're going really fast. But that's, um, 
that's the video. As you can see, dual surface is actually pretty, pretty featureless and bland. Almost like we weren't actually supposed to be down here. So it's curious as to why it has collision and why this is even here. So yeah, fun mission. I wanted to get this done before, you know, thermal gets added and presumably before this gets patched out or whatever. Um, little opportunity to uh, exploit the fact that the game is still in very, very early access. Uh, big thank you to the names on the screen. Of course, my Patreon supporters and my YouTube channel members to help make all of this content possible. There's also two videos on screen for my channel. Hopefully they're good picks. They should be because they're from my channel. But that's it. Thank you for watching, everyone. And I'll catch you in the next one.